Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, um, we, as we sat here and we thought, holy shit, they put us in this huge room. I wanted to say thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> uh, we're here to, uh, to give a, a, a brief presentation, some slides about some of the work we're doing at the University of California. Uh, I'm Todd Grappone. I'm Associate University Librarian at UCLA. With me are Saul Ismail and Peter Brantley. Um, and together, we've been um, talking about some practical uses of artificial intelligence in libraries. I'll give you just a little bit of a background. If I? Oh, there we go. OK. Slides. Oh, all right. Thank you. Um, we had a, uh, um, at UCLA, a donor come in and, and want to give us a rather large collection of um, documents they had collected over the years. It was specifically, um, it is specifically political cartoons and um, decades and decades worth of these cartoons from all over the world. Um, and if, like every donor you have to the library who wants to give you stuff, they want to see it up online immediately. And I thought to myself, how are we going to do that? You know, there's really very, uh, it's a very daunting proposition. So uh, I talked to the donor a little bit about some of the, um, uh, some of the things we've been talking about with regard to artificial intelligence and machine learning. And um, uh, he was interested. So I got interested in talking to some of my fellow colleagues here about the work we're doing. We put a little, um, working group together um, to look at um, uh, what we might do. And I'm just, I'm gonna uh, just briefly talk a little bit about um, what we're doing. We're doing a study in the capabilities of artificial intelligence for academic libraries. Uh, this study will investigate uh, artificial intelligent capabilities of academic libraries. Specifically, the study will focus on the ways in which libraries are using artificial intelligence to enhance services to improve user experience and enable more efficient and effective library operations. Uh, the study will include a review of current literature on the topic and a survey of academic libraries to assess their use of artificial intelligence. Um, the findings of the study will be discussed in terms of the potential impact for academic libraries to become AI aware and how implications and the implications for how libraries can best leverage AI to improve their services uh, the study will also suggest areas to further uh, research in the area of AI and academic libraries. So that's kind of what we're up to. <clears throat> we, um, uh, we pulled a group together from across the University of California from several campuses. Uh, we've had uh, uh, a few conversations and um, what we're, um, uh, what we're going to do is um, have conversations like this. I mean, this is not a, a presentation where we are going to go through a bunch of slides. We're here to really have a conversation about what this technology is doing and potentially how we might be able to leverage it a little bit better. So I'll talk about what the flow for the next 45 minutes will be. I'm Salva Ismail. I'm the Associate University Librarian for Digital Initiatives and Information Technology and the Associate CIO at UC Berkeley. And what Todd forgot to mention, or cleverly did not mention, was that our opening statement that he gave was actually uh, from OpenGPT. So uh, right there, we wanted to bring in uh, some practical use. So our flow for the next 45 minutes is we'll go ahead and introduce how this group was formed and what we're looking to do. We will then explore some ideas that we've been throwing around. And at this point, we invite you on this journey with us as we're exploring these things Think about how at your library with the services that your teams, or you provide for that matter, um, what are the things where we can use artificial intelligence for more operational cases? And at that point, we will also want to learn from you, as ja Todd said, in a conversational manner. Um, where can this go next? So with that, I will pass this right back on to Todd. Yeah, so um, I mentioned a little bit about the impetus behind you know, what we're doing. Um, you know, uh, so you stepped on my punchline, but that's okay. Um, uh, we'll soldier on. We, you know, we started. I, I want to say a couple things. Is we kind of believe in um, the quantum future. You know, so we believe that a lot of the uh, challenges that we have with regard to mass processing of machine data are. Um, you know, we feel like there's there's um, a light in, in the future. 
Um, uh, we believe in a future where um, storage is ubiquitous. And you know, I know uh, Cliff mentioned this morning in the plenary about sort of the challenges to the amount of research data that's being produced. Um, we share those issues. I mean, it, it, our campuses, uh, just like your campus, the amount of data that's produced every single day is astronomical. Um, but we also believe that if we uh, engage correctly with artificial intelligence, um, a lot of the fundamental library issues can be really improved upon. And we're hoping uh, that through these dialogues and through this conversation that we end up doing something that's important and impactful. Um, so, and I would say that the, you know, um, uh, just to reflect a little bit more on the plenary this morning, you know, the state of the industry with regard to artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, is, it's, the speed that that industry is improving is, is um, uh, very impressive and it needs constant attention. Um, are, we, are we risk being um, subsumed by some other industry and some other community? And that's really not what we, um, not the vision that we share for the future of academic libraries. So um, what happens after, you know, the uh, uh, digital deluge, you know, we have all these collections that we've digitized um, and we have all this data and we have, how are we supposed to um, uh, keep up with it? Uh, we have um, faculty coming into our uh, data science center at UCLA who want to use the collections we've digitized for uh, research, uh, for traditional humanities research, but also for text and data mining, uh, for image processing, uh, image visualization, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, image, <laughs> I can't remember the word. Um, uh, they want to use all of these digital files we have in ways that, you know, we didn't really intend when we digitized them. You know, we, we did it for preservation purposes, we did it for sharing purposes, but now they want to take all that stuff we did and they want to do even more with it. Um, and we need to uh, figure out how we do, uh, how we provide access to our things through those workflows. Um, but we feel like those tools can also help us with things like digital preservation and other systemic and challenging problems um, that we have in academic libraries. So we did form this working group. Um, none of my notes are showing up. Um, anyway, we formed this working group uh, um, uh, to talk about um, specifically our use case and to pull a bunch of different use cases together um, from um, uh, libraries across the University of California. Uh, we came, um, uh, we had a meeting, we had uh, one special guest that came in from um, a non-UC campus and we spent a day ideating about kind of what these things could do for us and we came up with a nice um, list uh, that we are uh, currently sort of uh, curating that has to do with um, uh, things like representation and metadata um, uh, things like um, um, uh, uh, taxonomic um, uh, browsing, you know, using different taxonomies um, I, on, on different collections. Just lots of really good ideas. Um, okay. And so that's what we um, are going to be doing is coming up with a strategy to make, uh, to make sure that the libraries within the University of California are AI aware. Um, it starts with a strategy, that's kind of what we're doing. We're putting together these ideas. We hope these ideas will stick and that we can um, um, rally behind a few of them in order to uh, really uh, um, uh, find some impactful work. Uh, we've also become very aware through this process that um, uh, we need to do a lot of uh, educating ourselves uh, and educating the people around us uh, with regard to what these products are and what the work is that we can do uh, in order to really um, uh, have a, a good conversation. Um, right, yeah, the, uh, the other part is really, you know, as I mentioned, we do have these collections. Um, they're really there uh, for us um, in, in a very traditional way, like other library collections are. But as we have faculty members coming into the, um, uh, to our libraries who want to use um, text and data mining tools, who want to do uh, computer visioning, who want to do some really uh, uh, 
uh, machine intense processing with our own collections. Um, we haven't really built those services. And part of what we're trying to do is um, uh, imagine what those services might look like and how we might, as a library, not only use these tools for ourselves, but also provide uh, services and access for our faculty members. Yeah, so that's, that's really what we're trying to do is define our own future. So um, as we kicked off this discussion, the three of us, um, uh, um, I, I was able to sit at a presentation from the CIO of the University of California system. His name was Van Williams. Uh, and he was encouraging um, all, I, all verticals, all IT verticals, and I consider the library an IT vertical, uh, within the system to uh, talk about how artificial intelligence might um, be deployed within their market and how they, um, we at the University of California might help define the product and the product suites that come from uh, these new technologies. And so that's exactly what we're doing. We're really, really, and working hopefully with, uh, with everyone uh, in the CNI community uh, to think about how we might dictate what the future is for these technologies within the academic library context. So the academic library context, I want to emphasize that a little bit. I think very often, you know, we, um, uh, um, we talk in, in broad terms about libraries, but academic libraries, I think, um, are really uh, interesting uh, and um, uh, deserve a little attention in this specific uh, domain just because of where we are and where the researchers are who are doing this kind of work and how we might reach into those labs and pull out those tools for ourselves. Um, and what that's kind of what we're trying to do uh, is have that conversation about about the academic library. Okay. We're going to we're going to play a little bit of um, laptop musical chairs here. Um, so when we started this conversation as a group, Peter, Todd, and I had several um, ideation meetings, just brainstorming meetings, and we really wanted to define a path forward. What was the path forward that we wanted? One of the things that we were certain about was we wanted to make sure that as we began this work, we wanted to underline that this was not a replacement for any kind of service that libraries provide or any kind of work that our library staff members do. It's actually just enhancing their work. So for those of you who may have used a chat bot on, say, AT&T or T-Mobile, you go in and you're like, hey, I need this help, and somebody goes in. At my university, UC Berkeley, our central uh, Berkeley IT system has chat bots for chat transcripts where you can go in and say, what time is the gym open? Um, so questions, basic questions that our librarians generally get to answer. What time is the library open? Where are your bathrooms at? Where's the stapler at? I've heard that's a very common question. So how do we enhance um, the work that we're already doing so that our professional staff can engage in more complicated tier two, tier three, and more complex issues um, around information science and then the work we do? And once again, as Todd said, one, wanted to underline here, we're focused particularly around operationalizing academic research library services. While AI and the um, uh, products that could be developed or tools that could be um, developed using artificial intelligence can have benefit for the entire GLAM profession and the information science profession, our focus is particularly academic research libraries, uh, born digital, digitized content, metadata services. Um, um, reference instruction literacy and others. So we did a little bit of a landscape analysis. We're aware of the uh, work that's already going on with leading the future of AI and public archives. Um, uh, the AI for LAM community, that's from Library of Congress, Smithsonian, uh, National. Um, the Cadre, Aeolian, and other projects that are out there in the field. So why particularly the UCs and why our invitation to learn from you here? Um, the University of California system, as the 10 libraries, are one of the largest um, collections. We do have massive print collections, but we also have massive digital collections when we look at ourselves as one system, one library. And it, we do actually have one of the largest AV holdings outside of Library of Congress at an academic library. Um, we also, the, for the University of California, nearly one-tenth of the national academic research comes out of the UC system. 
And looking at our users, the user base is really large, um, um, one of the largest. And finally, the past year in 2022, so it's 2021, the UCs implemented the first ever system-wide ILS, which was bringing all our collections together and um, having one general discovery platform for all the 10 UCs, our research library facilities, the two RLFs, we have a North RLF, a Southern RLF, and um, California Digital Library. So that gave us an unprecedented amount and access to not just the collections, but all the resources uh, that went into putting SILs together. So our model here is to develop a series of project proposals that are not just impactful, but can be operationalized, something that we can actually implement um, and talk about, like, hey, with X number of resources, X amount of funding, this is what we can do, and then take it to our UC leadership, and something that we can then accomplish within either bite-sized chunks and within a specific timeline. So with that, we have about another 20 minutes or so and this is where we would like to invite the members who are sitting here to help us ideate possible solutions for what this journey could look like as we embark on um, discovering and dis discovering, discussing, and collaborating on solutions that can be produced, collaborations we should look at. So as Todd mentioned earlier this year um, in December, November, when we brought together a gathering of folks from across different UCs. Uh, we had UC, uh, we had members from UC Davis, UC Berkeley, um, UC, um, UCLA of course, um, uh, UCSF, UCSD San Diego, and from IU. We had ideas thrown out. They were, we had a jam board, people could just throw ideas out there, we discussed those ideas. We had members from across metadata services to digital practitioners, to data practitioners, to pure technologists. And I'll throw out some ideas here to get the conversation started, which was around, um, can we process and evaluate born digital collections such that there are certain templates that could be created where the machine could just learn that these born digital collections, these are the authors, this is where sensitive information or private information is, so that the processing can be made easier or faster. Um, can we extract tabular metadata from digital files? Or how can we identify contents of an image to augment metadata and enhance discovery? This one's particularly interesting because in one of my PhD programs, we were working on I, image mining, but it wasn't just image mining, it was helping then the computer understand a person sitting on a sand or a beach. How, is, how, how does the computer understand that is a person and then tags it tags the metadata of that photograph with beach, sand, person, so that the next level of cataloging or metadata creation can happen. Um, using digital libraries, creating subsets of digital identification of, sorry, identification of specific individuals across university archives um, in multiple formats. Like how do we do OCR, for example, on non-Western languages or non-Roman languages? Or how do we automate the extraction of text um, from not just PDFs, but maps and other um, items that are being digitized or being given to us in a born digital format? So with that, I will open, we, we want to thank you for working, for hearing us talk about how this group came forward and what we're looking to explore and invite you to discuss solutions, thoughts, and ideas with us. So um, I uh, decided that one of the things that I wanted to do here was just try to uh, put a, a different kind of frame together around AI. Um, because one of the, I think one of the challenges that we have as libraries is that we're coming from a librarian background. And so you know, it's natural for us to think about our collections and um, metadata and the kinds of things that we've traditionally been strong at um, and to try to uh, utilize AI to do better at that and to bring new insights. And that's really a critical role for us. And you know, the kind of examples that uh, Sala just gave are um, 
increasing, you know, as, as they get more sophisticated, they're increasingly non-obvious. Uh, and that's really important. But I think that there's also, there are different frames, and I think we need to be cognizant of different frames. And so, you know, I want to um, sort of finish off our part of the presentation with an encouragement to not just think about what are your ideas, but what are the different frames that we can think about AI in. So um, for me, this was really crystallized in uh, late October, I helped with some colleagues, uh, including some friends at uh, UC, put together a small publishing conference called Page Break in San Francisco, which was in part the successor to a Mellon-funded uh, program called Books and Browsers. And Page Break brought together a whole bunch of different kinds of innovators in publishing, um, but uh, over a course of two days. And we invited Tim O'Reilly to close off for us. Many of us have connections to Tim often had to work for him in uh, various capacities. And we had no idea what Tim would come up to the podium and talk about. Uh, so, you know, he sort of came in sort of late on the second day and, um, and made it up to the stage. And what he decided to focus on was AI. And he talked about his history in publishing and uh, thinking about various types of innovation. And many of you may know Tim also has a, a pretty deep interest in uh, economics and sort of disruption of uh, e economic uh, landscapes and uh, sort of economic ideologies in a way um, uh, through technology and through greater societal change. And he recounted some of, in his career, how um, there had been several times where uh, at O'Reilly they had made decisions to wholly uh, pivot uh, from one course of act, one course to another. Uh, course of action. And so they did that early on with the, the guides that they developed, programming guides, uh, the books with the animal series that you all all very aware of. They pivoted again uh, in part through Safari, uh, books online where they started producing a, a great deal of video content as a way of uh, reaching out to uh, people to train them. And they pivoted again in COVID when they decided to shut down uh, their conference series. Uh, O'Reilly doesn't do conferences anymore. So in Tim's mind, AI was one of these, is one of these moments. It's essentially a, a burn the boats, um, you know, put everything you have into this innovation uh, tech set of technologies because it will really change fundamentally the way that you're doing business, right? It's not just uh, do better, it's really change the way we do business. And the example that he gave, which really stuck with me, was uh, partnering with an external uh, firm that's specializing in uh, AI-enhanced uh, 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 content, basically. They had their start working with sales catalogs online. So are, you're shopping for winter shoes, can I show you a scarf? Um, that kind of uh, associational uh, trick to help sort of build a context around a user experience. And so O'Reilly gave them all of their video content, right? So, and then what they did was instead of thinking about it as a black box, here's this video content, we'll use this one tool and produce this output. The innovation that they gen engendered, uh, basically the work of was a very small number of programmers, was that they set up a sequence of tools. And that's what I think what we should think about, is setting up sequences of tools, not just a box that you put content into and something comes out. So in their case, what they did was they took all of their English language video content, and then they had a tool that generated a transcription of it. Then another tool did a translation of that content into Spanish. Another tool married, vocalized that Spanish transcript into the video, another tool altered the facial pattern of the voicing of the word so it appeared as if the speaker was a native language Spanish speaker. And behind that, they had um, the transcripts with uh, the kind of enrichment that we know how to do, right? The, a lot of enrichments over tags and subject areas and um, you know, this RI and so forth. So um, ultimately a user could sit down and say, uh, or do a query like, uh, how do I set up, um, uh, you know, a, a containerized instance of Fedora, and then there would be, uh, you know, several in-context representations in English or Spanish. 
right? So this is an empowering of data beyond what we typically think of. And I think one of the things that we are particularly challenged to do is to step outside of our libraries. As, as my colleagues mentioned, we need to develop services not just for ourselves, but for our research communities, for the larger community that we work in and serve, which includes the public. So one of the things that I want to try to figure out is how do we broaden the conversation that we would normally have just with ourselves? Who are the data engineers? Who are the AI practitioners? who are the people with working with other kinds of content and other kinds of sort of associative technologies that we can bring together in a room outside of our discipline, right? There are people thinking about this in, in broad areas of publishing. There are people thinking about this in broad areas of, of other types of media content. There are other people trying to think about this in, in intelligence, right, in like military intelligence. Like why can that broader community help us understand about the fundamental revolution that AI can provide and how do we supercharge that conversation. So there are a lot of smart people here. We'd really like to hear your random or structured thoughts on, on you know, your impressions of AI. And if you've had things that you've been musing about, we'd love to hear them now or later. But um, you know, if anybody would love to or would like to start a conversation with us now, um, go for it. Please come on up. All right. Go ahead, Peter. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Peter Leonard from Stanford University Libraries. Um, I guess one question I would have for you guys is that um, many research libraries are different. Uh, some of them offer services for faculty in um, providing AI solutions, ML solutions, data science solutions for um, faculty research projects. Sometimes this is called digital humanity support, sometimes um, other broader terms. And those, uh, for the research libraries that are lucky enough to be able to offer those services, the things that are offered are often extraordinarily customized and hyper fit to the peculiar research agenda of a professor or, or a grad student. It strikes me that AI in the entire sort of library work cycle is that we need things that are perhaps not so hyper fit and instead reusable, um, generalizable, because we don't know if the next set of images being digitized from special collections are handwritten in English or Portuguese or, or something else. So I guess, I guess if you guys have any thoughts about this tension be between sort of um, really boutique services towards faculty research or institutional research projects, versus a type of uh, universally applicable AI solutions that might be relevant to all of libraries' work? Um, I have to stand. But uh, so yes, I think that that's one of the insights that AI can provide is that you know, we often customize first and then try to think about what kind of flexible, more general solution can be yielded from that. It's like, wow, we've put in a lot of effort into the, into this relatively Baroque uh, package, you know, how can we uh, leverage that? And I think one of the things that AI can provide us is to reverse that workflow. It can help us understand or work with a more generalized context and then permit us to uh, ring out of that very specific instances. And, and indeed there is like with, with all of the AI that we've seen, very much of an iterative process here. You know, so as, as we learn more about more detailed use cases, it helps us understand a broader generalized case that could serve a broader set of problems. But I, again, I think that the, one of the things that we need to bear in mind is, is that O'Reilly example of tools in sequence or in parallel, right? It's not just, you know, we don't want to build a, a big flexible box. We want to understand how to associate tools and services together in as many different ways as possible. And I think that's one of the really hard things, right, is to understand what that, um, you know, what that dynamism is in AI. It's not just, you know, building a, a, a new, you know, 370 mainframe that can do an awful lot of massive computing. Uh, it's about, you know, it's, Think of it more like a web stack in a sense, right? That here we've got lots of little pieces of software. You know, we have this maturity now in software design online that's really uh, transformatively greater than it was five years ago. 
And, and AI is, is that in a far larger magnitude kind of way. So how do we get to that point? Yeah, I would, I would throw a couple other thoughts in there in, in that, um, uh, you know, uh, libraries of, <coughs> excuse me, have always had standard ways for people to get into our collections, whether that's the front door or the catalog or a lot of other ways um, that people would, would get access to the website. Um, uh, you know, these, I think if we use these technologies, we talked about a couple here tonight, uh, this afternoon, um, we have, um, we have the same paradigm, you know, we tell people how to get into the library, you know, um, the new way might be, a, you know, a conversation you have um, with the library, you know, in the way we're having a conversation now. I mean, that's really interesting. Peter talked about that, um, uh, uh, the um, O'Reilly uh, example. I mean, what if we had that, uh, a service where every student, regardless of their native language, could talk to the library and get a response back in the language that they spoke in a conversational way? Um, those are the things we're, we're hoping to get to. Um, you know, I think we do have kind of a, a really an aha moment here in libraries uh, in that this technology um, will be there. Uh, it will be there uh, in our lifetime. Um, and I, you know, part of what I really worry about is that we've built these systems based on a, a kind of a paradigm around sort of words and concepts and these technologies are really a lot of smart people on my campus and yours figuring out ways where you don't have to do that anymore. So as we turn, you know, our entire information system on its head yet again in my lifetime and in yours, um, how are we going to position uh, cultural heritage and science and that sort of um, uh, uh, discourse that's been going on on our campuses in a way that uh, continues to make it um, not only relevant but accessible as well. Uh, so this is why we have to have these conversations because that's going to happen. That's going to happen. Todd, if I'm, Todd if, and Peter, if I may expand on that. So taking into account the example that you were giving, Peter, which is let's think of it as tools, right? Like it's a toolkit. We're building little things. We have small pieces, and together it builds this structure like Legos. And um, Todd, you brought in, like, how about if a student in their native lang language could talk to us, um, whichever language it may be, and gets a response back in, a ling in the language that they understand, the jargon, can we, that could be looked at, looked at as one Lego block. And then could that be expanded further then based on what we've learned from that tool to now interpreting documents that we may have in our digital collections or documents that we may, ha we may have from our born digital collections? and enhancing that piece by piece. Because more often than not, what I've done in my career in libraries and what I've done my colleagues and I've seen we do is we look at the final solution. Oh, we need to get to X. Now let's build this behemoth complex product, tool, platform, solution, initiative, whatever, keep going, to get to this major thing. And what we're looking at is, let's talk about reverse engineering that. Let's have these little blocks that eventually get us there, but let's not think about what that X might be. Let's talk about small Lego pieces, and then we'll see if it builds us the Eiffel Tower or the Washington Monument. Hello, I'm Jason Clark from Montana State University Library. Um, I'm going to try to put this into words. I'm terrified and excited by this technology. I think, um, <laughs> and one of the things I, I think I would give advice to anybody who's starting to think about this, Todd hit on how quickly this is moving and how it does demand a certain amount of attention. I think it also demands a certain amount of honesty. There are components of this, if it is successful, that will sunset parts of our jobs. And it's okay to say that out loud. In fact, I think when you're trying to be an advocate for this, it's important to say that out loud. So when I can go to a place like GitHub Copilot and help ask them in a chat interface to write code for me, what does that do to software development or our application developers? So this is not just about generating metadata. It, it potentially touches all parts of our organization. So 
What I, would, what I would guide us towards or something else to think about as you're bringing this, these initiatives forward is honesty and also starting to build out computational literacy for, for what this means what, and how do you prompt these engines and how do you build with this technology. I'm excited to see where this goes. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, I, just before, I, one of the things we were talking about earlier um, in this conversation, not necessarily today, um, was really the um, uh, sort of that, uh, what we're all sort of feeling in this post-pandemic world where everybody feels like there's too much work to do and you kind of, you know, everybody's talking about how stressed you are. And, you know, I was thinking about ways um, me as a technologist in libraries might actually do something practical. Um, and I thought about some of this stuff, you know, where you can kind of, um, uh, do things at a scale that you, you couldn't really do without this technology and how that might not necessarily replace everybody, um, but allow people to work um, uh, in a way that they always intended to work, you know, something that's not quite so, you know, uh, deadline driven crushing, but, you know, uh, that's more thoughtful and reflectful. And I think this kind of technology can help uh, us do that. Uh, as an industry. I would also say that I think research libraries at least are in a stronger position than we might have been. Just it took, a, it took a revolution in network technology to get us to a point where we can talk quasi-intelligently about AI. And so there, I, I, I think we do need to respect what the impact of it will be. Um, and there, there is an incredible stress here. We are learning, uh, Cliff talked earlier today about the uh, a rapidly evolving uh, understanding about rights, intellectual property rights associated with uh, some of the creativity that can come out of AI. And it's something that we really do not understand and we certainly do not have uh, law, uh, you know, decided law on many of these aspects yet. Um, but it, there's also this, there is a, an incredible tension here in that this is a very fast moving technology and we don't have two generations of staff refreshment to ha have suddenly a, a fully AI trained cohort walking into our libraries, our museums, and our um, national agencies. We need to train ourselves to open our own eyes to what can happen here. And that is going to be a very high impact transition for us. And we don't know yet what that will mean. And I'll add, Jason, that we've been following the work Montana State has been doing through the IMLS grant of the AI and ethics um, um, work that it's been doing. So as I, I probably mentioned it briefly, that at, we're, we're looking at it from an ethical point of view. But the very statement that we, Todd and I were discussing this in the morning, and we said was, our staff are overburdened. They're telling us their morale is low. They can't keep doing everything. They can't keep wearing 50 hats that we're asking them to wear, right? Five hats in some cases are 50. So how do we actually provide, use this AI technology maybe to provide some practical solutions? Again, I go back to um, why are we, should we be, waste, should we be use, utilizing our time answering where the stapler is or where the bathrooms are? Wayfinding solutions don't work. So are there ways in which those things could be operationalized or made more practical so our librarians and our staff can actually do more enhanced work. Maybe they're not cataloging level one metadata uh, musical scores anymore. Now they're providing more enhanced work on this. Again, it's evolving. We will be learning. Um, and I think I read a tweet earlier today, which was, we can't, you know, we'll, we'll need to experiment and learn. And I'll finally end by saying, when Open, open GPT, the chat thing on Twitter, took off the past two weeks and everyone's talking about it. Um, and we mentioned, it was mentioned in the earlier plenary around, well, will, will we have authors anymore? Will books be published? Because OpenGPT can totally write books. And there was this author, and I can't remember her name right now, but she tweeted about it and she said, you know, I will still have a job. I'm still the one coming up with ideas and thoughts and creating the words that build a story. Um, Maybe in 100 years it might be different, but at least in the next, my lifetime, I'll say, um, we may still be learning on how this technology that's evolving needs to change, be updated, iterated, and improved. Hi, um, whoa, uh, I'm Derek Devnich. I'm at University of California at Merced. 
Um, and I want to talk to you later about a very specific project. I'm not going to take airtime for that right now. Um, I want to tell an open GPT story and then ask a follow-up question for him. Uh, the open GPT story, for those of you who have not been following on Twitter, um, there's a bunch of people who are writing queries to have it generate all kinds of things, like a mission statement for your university, or <laughs> which is tragically on point, or, <laughs> or a business plan, or, you know, all, or poetry, or all kinds of things. Um, but a lot of people have asked it to write code. Um, so if you ask OpenGPT a, a question in the form of an SQL statement, it will hallucinate a database with the appropriate columns and then give you back tabular data that actually answers your question. Just FYI, try it out, it's amazing. Um, and the follow-up question, so um, following up on, on uh, the concerns of our, our colleague from Montana State, um, the problem with all statistical learning systems is that they do the best they can under all circumstances, so they typically need adult supervision. This is the issue. Like, we get C-plus student essays out of OpenGPT, right? Um, and so the workflow question is a very practical question for any, any of these engines that we have is what do we, how do you insert appropriate supervision at the appropriate points? So you have someone basically copy editing, vetting this stuff. I'm wondering if you have any like, um, like concrete thoughts about how that would be applied to particular projects that you have or that you're working on. Could you repeat the latter part of the question? Just the end? Please. Yeah, sorry. Um, do you have any particular thoughts about how you insert like actual human supervision um, and vetting of sort of a, an AI process that's sort of doing the grunt work but maybe needs some supervision? I, I mean, I think at first that's um, that will be implicit because we don't know what we're doing, and and so you know we only have to try to figure out how the tools are responding and uh, the output that they're generating um, and try to figure out how to improve um, the, uh, the symbiosis between uh, you know, us as instigators of that set of technology and, um, and then the outputs that we get. And there is a broad class of, of AI systems where the, one of the greatest challenges is we still don't know why they work or how they work more precisely. And um, particularly, I think, in, in fields that are, where this is really critical, like biomedical applications, there's quite a bit of work trying to understand you know, how to develop AI models that actually uh, generate the optimal outputs um, that are preferred in, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a given scenario in an applicable scenario. And so that's in some ways sort of a meta level of understanding or um, administration of AI systems is, uh, is, is not to assume that the AI is the best AI, right? It, and, and to try to figure out how AIs do the learning that they do and how to improve that learning process to get different kinds of outcomes. So I, I think we have to not just work with the tools, but understand you know, how the tools get constructed and the kinds of outputs that they generate and you know, leverage that. So you know, as, as Saul was creative um, analogy uh, suggested, you know, this is very much going to be the case too in sort of the engineering aspect where we have to have our hands involved. Making it very basic from I was chatting with a reference colleague of mine from Florida, that's where I'm from, and uh, one of the things we were talking about, since you mentioned OpenGPT, and I will say that we've been talking about um, GitHub Copilot because it helps you develop your code. You can basically write your code, enter functions, and real time it'll code with you. But my colleague and I, we were discussing around information literacy, how do we bring in this adult supervision that you were talking about, which is maybe at some point, our instructional methods will change. How we, instead of asking students, let's produce a paper that's three pages around a thesis topic that you've chosen, we actually tell them, yes, use one of the AI tools to write a paper, to get a paper written, and now go ahead and critique that paper. So what you're doing is bringing in adult supervision in a way which is you're using the technology to give you an output but then you're critiquing that output, and then you can continue to feed the system. And I will say, I just learned this the other day. I was looking at some academic plagiarism code of conduct, and for the most part, most academic code of conducts include um, talking about 
um, it's considered plagiarism or dishonesty if another human being, another person writes the paper for you. And as was discussed earlier somewhere, um, AI is not a person, and AI is definitely not another human being. So I want the implications in that case, um, as these technologies are developed, will be beyond just libraries, right? It'll be in our academic code of honor and conduct and other policies that our universities use. I mean, the only thing I would add is, you know, it's really part of what we're trying to do is um, answer that question because it's impossible to answer right now. Um, I don't know what how this technology is going to be deployed, but I think a library website you might see in, in 10 years is not going to have, uh, not going to be centered on a search box, you know? You know, we might not be doing semantic searching uh, across the catalog. Um, you know, we may be doing a lot of different things. Um, and I think that's kind of the point of what we're trying to do is, you know, what does it look like when we um, aren't, when we don't do Boolean searches, when it's really this other kind of input uh, and a different kind of output. Um, and whether that's, uh, you yeah, know, we spend a lot of time talking about um, uh, archival collections. Um, we're also worried about this um, uh, um, uh, other kind of, of data collections and how we might make those accessible. Um, uh, our human uh, uh, interaction with people, reference, et cetera. I mean, all of these things I think are gonna be uh, fundamentally changed by this technology in the next few years and we really need to, we, us, need to Thank really think us. about these things uh, and um, uh, to, to the degree we can as a community, experiment with solutions. Um, I know we're right at time, but we'll take one more question. Okay. It's up to you. We can take one more question, but members of the audience, please feel free to leave if you have to, because we know we're right at time. And thank you, everyone. Okay, well, I'll keep this very brief then. And, and it riffs on some of the points you've been making. My name's Nathan Gerth from the University of Nevada, Reno. And I, I wonder if we can reframe it from adult supervision to really capturing that synergy. Because I think the key in this is that we think of AI and humans. And what has struck me over the past couple of weeks as I've seen my wife who's an academic grappling with some of these plagiarism, plagiarism issues, as I've seen other people just experimenting, like d dumping data into these things to see if it hallucinates a data set or something like that, it's, it's that creative synergy that's really going to drive some of these developments. And I think building in a way that we can uh, embrace, what's the term, uh, the capability overhang Right? and find those moments, captures those moments when people are a little bit creative with this and do something that's oddball as opposed to kind of doing the obvious. Because I think that you're spot on when you talk about this not being a reformulation or a refinement of where we are as library professionals, but either it's, it's really fundamentally turning it on its head. And so I, you, know, you, don't, you can choose to comment that if you're on time, but I do think that it's that formulation of AI versus humanity that is sort of misleading that really is the combination, it's that synergy that's going to really be transformative. Yeah, I think that's a great way to end this yeah. panel, so thank you for that. And I would just, you know, sort of underline, you know, one of the things that I think that we all need to look for is to be surprised yeah. and, um, and to look forward to that because that is what will open up our eyes. Thank you all for coming, we really appreciate it. Thank you.